Father, in the, in the name of Jesus, we come to you thanking you for the opportunity to study a portion of your word. We ask that your spirit of truth abide within us, teaching us all things and guiding us into all truth. Please be with the uh, the, in, in, the the teacher, uh, Brother Charles. Uh, you've uh, he has a tremendous gift that you you've given him. And we thank you for that, knowing that every good gift, every perfect gift comes from above, coming down from the Father of lights, whom is no variable to see the shadow of turning. Be with uh, all of us. We pray that we have a, uh, a very revealing uh, session into your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I appreciate that. And, um, you know, I, I love the fact that you said, let's have a revealing session because that's one of the, the primary benefits of being able to really dive into the word of God and study the word of God is that we do get this revealing. Uh, the, the Bible almost sometimes works like an, an onion when you just unpeel and it's layer after layer after layer. And you can study the scriptures for years and then dive into a text that you may have read a dozen times and find out that you've unpeeled a new layer <laughs> to that. So the meaning of, of God's word is just so profound and it's so deep. And that's one of the reasons, that's, I, for me, this, this is one of the kicks I get out of studying is especially when I come across material for the second or third or whatever time and I get something brand new out of it every single time uh, it seems. So one of the, the very benefits, great benefits of the dynamic nature of God's word. So I'm gonna go ahead and get the screen shared and organize my panels here so we can kind of take a look at what we have for the evening. All right, so that's going and I can find my window. Okay, looks like we got it. All right, normally I have Henry up here, but I don't see him tonight. Uh, Andrew, can you see the presentation? Yeah, okay, you can just nod, I got you. All right, so here we are, the seed principle. Once again, we are on uh, chapter eight as we get ready to crank up chapter eight for tonight. And in chapter eight, we're talking about thorny ground. All right, so last week we covered the first uh, soil condition when we talked yeah. about the hard soil. And now we're talking about uh, thorny ground. So we're talking about thorny soil and the various things that come along with that. So there's a quote that says, if you care, only care enough for a result, you will almost certainly attain it. Only then you must really wish for these things and wish for them exclusively and not wish for a hundred other things at the same time that are incompatible just as strongly. Okay, so... Uh, the whole point of this is the fact that as you go through life, you have to make sure that your desires are compatible. All right, you wanna make sure that your desires are in a place where you uh, don't have incompatible things. You're not going after one goal on the left hand and then a different goal on the right hand. So if I'm going after uh, trying to lose 10 pounds, at the same time, I desire to eat 10 Twinkies. I have incompatible goals that go against each other. All right, so obviously that type of mentality, these types of things do not work. And that's not gonna be very helpful for you. So what we discussed last week, we talked about the adversary. All right, and the adversary as we identified as uh, revealed in the scripture, it's a Hebrew, uh, it's called Hasetan, right? So Hasetan means the adversary or the opponent and it is always, we, we find that the devil is always revealed in that sort of manner, okay? It's always the Satan. Uh, so even though Satan is not a proper name, we, we find that the Satan, as it's referred to as the adversary or the opposer, is the one who is opposing us. And he is referred to by that title. So the Satan can take the form of anything that obstructs you from doing God's will, uh, one of the very interesting things about the way that God chose to make us is that he made man in his image and he made man to be in charge of this particular environment. 
So when we take a look at planet Earth, again, you go back to Genesis 126 and the text says, let them rule, okay, over the fish of the sea and the birds of the sky and the cattle and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth and over all the earth. So uh, God created man so that man could rule in this environment. And you have a very powerful uh, archangel by the name, well, we refer to him as Satan. But when Satan wants to do something here on earth, uh, because Satan was not given the authority here on earth to rule directly, everything that he does has to be done through the person, the people who God gave the authority to, uh, which is why we, we want to always make sure that we take a look at any form, all right, in which Satan can appear. So if God gave the authority to man to rule this earth together, all right, mankind, when Satan wants to carry out something here, he has to go through man. So you and I, we have to be extra uh, diligent and we have to be on guard to make sure that Satan is not working through us to take away from doing God's will. So anything that obstructs God's will from being done is a form of Satan. You recognize Satan through sober vigilance. Okay, this is as Peter describes it when he says, be sober and be vigilant. Your adversary, the devil, is going around as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. So Peter's advice to us on how we recognize and how we're going to uh, be able to really notice Satan when he comes is by paying careful attention. And this lesson is so pertinent for us because we live in a society full of distractions. There's not one, not two, but there's a thousand things that could take your focus off of God on any given moment, on any given day, Sunday through Saturday, there's televisions and there's flashing screens and lights. We got screens everywhere. There's a screen in your living room. There's a screen in your pocket. Uh, there's a screen that you can stare at at work all day. They got screens in your car now. There's just screens and, and everything that's in line to distract you. You have to be in a position where you're ready to pay attention. So when we observe the example of Jesus in Matthew 16, 23, uh, this is when Peter in a very well-meaning way uh, said some things that were against the will of God. And Jesus called him out and it says, get behind me, Satan. Not talking about Peter, but talking about uh, the, the message that came to him saying that he did not have to suffer. He did not have to go to this cross and that this thing would never happen to him. Jesus obviously had the wisdom to know that this was against the will of God. So he recognized Satan in that form. If you are not paying attention Satan can come and he can capture you with uh, a seemingly innocent thing. You know, somebody who's very well-meaning and saying something to you can be a form of Satan for you if you're not paying attention. So you have to be sober and you have to be vigilant and you have to pay attention so that you can know when Satan is approaching you. We also talked about how all living things grow. Everything that is alive has to grow. Uh, fish grow, birds grow, plant life grows, humans grow, all living things grow. The word of God is a living thing. Again, as we observe this parable, the seed principle, uh, the word of God is compared to a seed that gets planted. And when a seed gets planted, the seed needs room to grow. And throughout this parable, as we look at it again in Luke chapter 8, you see that the seed, the living thing that uh, gets planted into the proper environment, has room to grow uh, if it can get in. So last week, or I guess it was two weeks ago when we talked about the hard soil, there was no room to get in in the first place. And then last week it got in, but there were rocks. Okay, so those rocks were the form of Satan. And you see that he's planted all those rocks in your environment and it's up to you to dig them out. When Satan has planted rocks in your mind to try to stop the word of God from growing, you have to be a cultivator. You're gonna to have to pull out your shovel and you're gonna to have to get to work to get those rocks out of the soil, okay? Once you get the rocks out, the word of God has a room to breathe and do the things that it needs to do. Then we also talked about when the heat is turned up in your life, dig deep into the word of God to be refreshed by his spirit. Living water will keep you from being dehydrated. All right, so Jesus talks about being living water and how his word, once again, becomes living water for us. And I love that, uh, once again, we contrasted two different versions of this parable. 
Uh, so in Mark's version and in, and in Luke's version, we see two different things where one talks about how the word was uh, not able to survive, okay? The rocky soil because one said that the roots were not able to grow deep enough and the other said that the heat was too hot. You know, the, the, the sprout became scorched by the heat. Uh, basically two different ways of saying the same thing but at the end of the day, whether God is, is allowing the heat to be turned up in your life, which can happen sometimes, in those moments where the heat gets turned up, what you're supposed to do, your response is for your roots to go deep. You're supposed to dig more into the living water. And that's how you get the hydration. So every problem that you face, I think sometimes we have the tendency to pray when something is going on, Lord, take this thing away from me. And sometimes God will, God will remove the thing. Sometimes God will not remove the thing, but what God will do is give you the strength to endure it. So you have to prepare your mind to be ready to go either way. If I pray that God takes this thing away from me, maybe he'll take it away or maybe he'll make me stronger. Be prepared for that response as well. What God will not do is just leave you there alone to scorch. He's giving you the resources, so he's going to either remove the problem or he's going to give you the help. Lord, make me stronger so that I can endure this. If you remember Jesus's prayer, again, in the Garden of Gethsemane, it was a take this away. And once he realized that that was not going to take place, what God did was give him the strength. Okay, so be prepared. Sometimes God will take it away and sometimes God will give you the strength. Either way, you're going to get help from God as long as you rely on him and lean in him. If you have rocks and thorns and thistles, it's going to prevent you from getting that nourishment from that living water that you need. And that's going to make your life uh, a lot more difficult. And the last point, we said we need to cast out fear. All right. So dig up those rocks. That's what the rocks are. Dig them out. Get rid of them and embrace. OK, plant this instead of the rocks plant faith, hope, and love, all right? And we kind of expounded upon that and we talked about how that's refreshing and how it's gonna help us on our journey. Get rid of the fear and embrace faith, hope, and love. So tonight, uh, we're gonna talk about thorns, okay? So what we have as we continue through this parable, uh, and I don't think this, the people who divided up this, the uh, Bible, the New Testament into verses, Probably didn't mean to do it this way, but it just so happens that in Luke, Mark, and Matthew, verse 7, and all three mention the thorns. So in Luke 8, 7, it says, other seed fell among the thorns, which grew up, and it choked the plants. And in Mark 8, 7, it says, other seed fell among the thorns, which grew up and choked the plants, so that they did not bear grain. So a little bit more detail there. And then in Matthew 13, 7, it says, other th seed fell among thorns, which grew up and choked the plants. So the common thing that we see going on with the thorns is that these thorns have a tendency to choke out the plants. The plant is what was planted. Again, the plant is the seed, the word of God. Uh, so uh, this scenario is a little bit different. All right, so as Jesus goes through this parable, he, he paints different pictures of ways that his word could somehow become ineffective. And in every scenario, he always mentions, it's not the word itself. The word is never ineffective, but the soil condition can render the word ineffective. Just like you could take a perfectly good seed and plant it under your carpet and put UV rays on it and you can water it and you will never get, uh, you'll never get any sort of crop out of that. It's not the seed's fault, it's the environment's fault. Carpet is not equipped to grow seed. So here we see, this week, all right, good ground. And the seed gets planted into that ground. And whereas last week, okay, in the last parable, in, in verse number six, you had problems in the soil, which prevented the seed from growing up to its full maturation. This time you have problems outside of the soil that prevent the seeds from growing to their full maturation. So whereas last week we dealt with internal issues, now we're dealing with external issues, which can inhibit seed growth. 
So I got a picture of a very thorny uh, looking ground over here. And you could imagine that if you tried to plant something in that environment and it tried to sprout up and grow, you can see what's gonna happen to it. It's going to be choked out. And that is exactly what happened here. So um, I love that Jesus continues to paint these pictures for us, all right? Problem number one, hard ground that it can never even get in in the first place. Problem number two, it got in, but there's so much junk in your mind, it can't be effective. Problem number three, it got in, and it's not the junk in your mind, it's the junk in your life. It's the junk outside. So now uh, this seed is being acted on by an external force. All of these things have the power to kill the seed. And the first uh, point that the author makes in the book is, is the cares of the world, okay? In Matthew 13, 22, it says, now he who received the seed among the thorns is he who hears the word and the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word and he becomes unfruitful. So there it is again. It wasn't necessarily internal issues uh, to the same degree. I think, you know, you can always attribute some of it to internal issues because we all have uh, some internal issues, right? But the major culprit in this scenario has to do with outside things. Riches of the world. Uh, there was too much, you know, too much of the career that I pursued. Uh, there were uh, deceitfulness of the world. There were other things out there that uh, just got to me and, and got around my environment and they just choked me out. Okay. And that could cause you to become unfruitful. Now, um, Many times people, all right, so if we, if we take, again, the, the spiritual application, we talk about new converts, there are many times people who obey the gospel and then they spring up rejoicing. All your sins have been forgiven and a new way of life has emerged, but a problem can arise when you fail to inform a new convert of the tough road ahead. If you are responsible for teaching a soul about Christ, you must be prepared uh, to inform them of the unique challenges that lie ahead. So uh, we, we sometimes can do our people that we're teaching a disservice by trying to paint an inaccurate picture of what it's like to walk in Christ. Even Jesus himself, he did not try to sugarcoat uh, the way that the experience would be when following him. He repeatedly told his disciples that they would be persecuted. He repeatedly told them that they would have troubles in this world. He repeatedly told them that uh, they're going to smite the shepherd and then the sheep are going to scatter. And you see warning after warning after warning where Jesus is not sugarcoating some of the things that come along with following him and paying the price. But we have to be careful to not try to sugarcoat the gospel and try to sugarcoat this walk with God like it's just going to be super sweet all the time. That is uh, doing a disservice, okay, to the people who are coming in. Now, obviously there are the many benefits and um, we, we focus on the, the fact that whatever it is that we have to go through in this life, it becomes worth it in the end. And we're gonna teach that and we're gonna show them that. But you need to show them the whole picture, okay? Don't just paint the rosy side without showing them the other side. Cause that's how the cares of the world and these thorns, they come up and they choke people who are not aware and they are not prepared uh, for the fiery trials that they're going to face. Look at this example from Jesus. Luke chapter 14, verse 28 through 30 says, for which one of you, when he wants to build a tower, does not first sit down and calculate the cost to see if he has enough to complete it. Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who observe it will begin to ridicule him saying, <laughs> this man began to build and was not able to finish. You look foolish. You look silly. How could you go into this whole construction project and you didn't know that you needed these materials? You didn't know that you needed this budget. You certainly wanna do everything in your power. You wanna do everything possible to try to convince someone to follow Christ. But you, again, you gotta make sure that they count the costs, okay? So we wanna make sure that we tell them about all the different things that are gonna take place. Your life is gonna change, <laughs> okay? And sometimes it may be a little bit uncomfortable but it's not intolerable and it's not uh, unattainable, okay? We can all complete this life. We can all complete this walk with Christ, 
because the one who is for us is stronger than whatever force is going to come against you. God is not pleased with lukewarm people. And there's several scriptural examples of that. He doesn't want people who just rush into baptism and fall away quickly because they were not prepared to make the sacrifice. The sacrifice is necessary to thrive. So when you take that and you bring it into this parable example, as we can see already with the different soil conditions, if I'm somebody who has hard soil, there's a lot of work that has to be done. There's a lot of sacrifices that have to be made. We're going to have to get a backhoe and go into the ground and dig it up and get that soil from being hard to being soft. So then we can receive it. We got to get underneath that, that top soil that's super hard. You got to penetrate that and dig in and get some of that uh, good soil underneath and mix that in. That's work. And people have to do that kind of work and be willing to do that kind of work in their life to get rid of the hard soil condition. If I'm a rocky soil person, I have to be ready to do the work. These are the sacrifices that have to be made in order to thrive. I got to get all the rocks out, okay, so that I can clear so that the word of God can do what it needs to do. If there are thorns everywhere in my life, I have work to do. I have sacrifices to make, okay, in order for me to be effective for Christ and to be fruit bearing for Christ, I need to know about the work that's ahead. Don't give me Kool-Aid gospel. Don't sprinkle me with this sweet stuff telling me that it's all good. And God has this different requirement that I find out about later on. By that point, the cares of the world, I'm choked out because I didn't know about this. So don't do that to somebody, okay, when you're teaching them the gospel. Now, we're going to take a, a chance to take a look at some of the challenges that a born again soul should prepare for. So I, I listed a few that we'll go through here and I also want you to put some in the chat so I can read those out. Uh, so what are some of the challenges that a born again soul should prepare for? And again, this I, and we're talking about teaching people the gospel and, and new converts and, and uh, being born again, but this also is a good reminder lesson for us because sometimes we can forget these very fundamental things. Temptation, to work, sleep in and do other leisure activities on the day of worship. Once again, you got a new convert who's coming in and they have probably been used to doing whatever they want to do on their Sundays. This was not the Lord's day for them. This was not a day for them to honor God or give reverence to God. There's a funny story. I have a neighbor uh, and, and he's a big Cowboys fan. He's, he's a bigger Cowboys fan than me. So we just talk about, you know, football going back and forth and uh, always fun discussions. And I can remember one, one Sunday, you know, we came home from worship. And you can tell this was like back in the day when we used to could drive and meet and all that kind of stuff. So way back in the day uh, when we used to come home from worship and I came home one afternoon and the Cowboys were getting to play and uh, they had a three o'clock game. And I saw him outside. He was like, man, I thought we kicked off at 12 today. He was like, I just, I skipped worship because I thought it was a 12 o'clock kickoff. I could have gone, I could have went to church if I'd have known it was three. I say, like, bro, you know, where are your priorities? So sometimes you can have these uh, leisure days, right? These are the type of activities that we have in our mind. And this is something that you have to prepare people for. What else is going to come their way? You're going to have to start saying no to some of the vices that you previously would have said yes to. There are things that will come your way. There are certain drinks that you like to drink and they get you into a mood where you can do your thing. You're going to have to start saying no to some of those things. There's some folks you used to run with who will go and do this and go do that. You're going to have to change your environment. And it's always uncomfortable when you're used to doing something that you now hear a no to what you used to always say yes to. These things can become thorns that choke people out. Newcomers have to be prepared. What about alienation from family and friends? Again, uh, Matthew 10, 34 through 36. You know, so Jesus is gone and he's made it clear that you have to put me above your mother or your father or your sister or your brother or your spouse or anybody, even yourself, your own life. You got to put your creator and your creator's will for you first. And when you start doing things like that, that can alienate you from your former uh, crews and cliques and all the people you used to hang with. This is something folks have to be prepared to know about. 
You cannot expect to start walking in a new direction. And sometimes you're just not going to be able to hang around those same people. If they're not going to be on the level that you're on, you're walking in the spirit now and you're walking in this new light. And if they refuse to, to join and respect that, and they want to continue to pull you back into the way that you used to be to bring that old man out, there's going to be some alienation. Either that or you're going to be choked back in. They're going to need to know that they're going to have to stand firm on their faith as the world becomes increasingly hostile towards Christ. We're watching this unfold before our very eyes. Uh, we live in a very unique point in world history, in the history of Christendom, right? So for the past 2,000 years, we're kind of living in cake land. And the reason I say that is because Christianity is not uh, something that's really frowned upon in this nation. It's not taboo here. But if you think about the, the first century church in the middle of Rome, facing Roman persecution from the outside, and then Jewish persecution from the inside, it was a double whammy. It was an uncomfortable time to be a Christian. And it's been that way for a long period of time. And so we've kind of gotten into these days where we're not facing as much persecution, but watch this thing start to, uh, to circle around, okay? If you go around and you say anything bad about homosexual marriage or homosexual relationships, guess what's going to happen to you in the year 2020? All right. You have to be prepared because sometimes God is going to ask you to take a stance on something that can be uncomfortable. And for somebody uh, who has not been prepared for this, that thorn can choke them out and completely uh, get them out of the gospel. And then everything becomes ineffectual for them. And I'm going to read a few from the comments. So it says, being attacked by people from their past life, which is true, right? We talked about that from alienation from family and friends. Uh, another one says, <laughs> family and friends, negative influences. Once again, family not agreeing with their new life. All right. So uh, that's another point. Uh, find friends in Christ and leave the non-Christians behind. All right. So uh, once again, so far, everything's been around family and friends. I think that's that's huge uh, because these are people who we've grown bonds with and we love these people and we've been with these people. So she's saying you have a new family. All right. So if my old family is not accepting me and they're starting to neglect me or disown me, then I have to cling even closer to my new family in Christ. So God does not leave you familyless. He's going to give you another family that you can attach yourself to. A non-Christian spouse, that can be a big issue. Uh, someone says, recognize Satan on a daily basis in the negativity of others and things. Okay, so being on the lookout. Mature Christians can be insensitive to babes and cause them to fall away. And uh, that's another really good point. And that's an understated point. And the fact that we have to be very careful how we talk to people and how we talk to babes. I've had that experience personally uh, with a friend who I brought from, uh, and, and when they came and they just happened to talk to the wrong person who said something highly offensive to them. And it took me years to you know, try to get them back. So we have to be very, very careful about the way we talk to people. Avoid indulging in material possessions and not giving back to God. Uh, that's that's another good point, right? So before you come into Christ, you think that all your money belongs to you. So when it's now told to be a cheerful giver into the work of the Lord, and you like, man, I ain't got the budget for it. <laughs> you know, I don't have anything to give. But you know, so so this is going to be something that you have to come to grips with when you come to the faith in Christ. Your money does not belong to you anymore. God is giving you stewardship over it. But it's up to you to use this in a manner that's pleasing in his sight. So these are new things that have to be taught to new converts and some of us old heads as well. Uh, realizing that the problems that you had before do not magically disappear. Amen to that. Being afraid to show your faith to coworkers. Absolutely. Uh, being overwhelmed by how much you need to work on, how much you have to unlearn and how much you need to change. All right. Feelings of inadequacy in terms of knowing the book, chapter, and verse when faced with questions about your conversion. That's a solid point. That's a really, really good one. 
Um, all right, and what happens when your Christian friends uh, can become the negative influence, okay? So all of these are really, really, really good things. So I appreciate you guys for putting that in. But understand that preparation is a huge part of us being able to walk in the way that God would have us to walk. And I know I talked a lot in this first part about uh, we're talking about conversion and, and bringing new babes into Christ. But understand that preparation is not only just important for new babes in Christ. Preparation is very important for those of us who have been in uh, the body for a while as well. The second point we want to talk about is expectation. OK, so once we have our preparation down, we need to go into our expectations and make sure that our expectations are aligned with what God would have. Galatians chapter six, eight says, for the one who sows to his flesh will from the flesh reap corruption. But the one who sows to the spirit will from the spirit reap eternal life. So once you've prepared a soul for the challenges that might be faced, it's important to set the proper expectations. A person should not think that just because they've been baptized, your previous vices will suddenly disappear. Someone just mentioned that in, in the comments. All right, your tendency to cuss ain't gonna go away overnight. It's, it's going to come out the water with you, okay? You might still want to overindulge in those drinks. You might still want to get on those substances from time to time. Your child support payments are not going to magically fall off your paycheck just because you got saved. All the things that you've done, your sins are going to be completely washed away, but the consequences of your sins will remain. It is important that we understand that so that we don't get discouraged and fall off. Getting baptized into Christ uh, giving your life to the Lord, being added to his church is not some magic pill that makes all the problems of your life disappear. So Galatians 6, 8, this scripture is so important for us because it gives us uh, the things that we should expect. If you've been spending the last 20, 30, 40, 50 years of your life sowing into the flesh, guess what you're reaping right now? What you've been sowing into your flesh for decades. When you come out the water, you begin to sow into the spirit. So the corruption's still there. It's not going away overnight. Over time, it will lessen and lessen and lessen. And the burdens of the things that you used to do will lessen over time. But you got to have the expectation that this is not an overnight microwave, get rich quick. I'm going to call Terrence back. Anything that you would say about what he's doing as far as um, uh, things that will take place overnight, don't expect this thing to happen magically in one fell swoop. Everything that you did, the consequences will still be there. In Mark chapter 4, verses 26 through 29, and he said, the kingdom of God is as if a man should scatter seed on the ground and should sleep by night and rise by day and the seed should sprout and grow, and he himself does not know how. For the earth yields its crop itself, first the blade, then the head, after that the full grain in the head. But when the grain ripens, immediately he puts the sickle to it because the harvest has come. So what Jesus is trying to get us to understand here is that these things, the kingdom of God, he talked about how, you know, it, you plant this, a seed of the kingdom of God and it's going to just spread and grow without you ever even noticing. The process of growth usually takes place in a manner that you don't realize. Just like if you have children or grandchildren, you, you don't notice their daily growth, but they are growing physically every single day. You don't, you don't see it, you, you, it just sort of happens. When you start putting good habits into your life, it's not gonna just magically appear overnight, but that growth is taking place. It's important to know the growth is taking place. You don't know how it's happening, but it is happening. First, you see a little bit, then you see that. And then he says, when the grain ripens, it's harvest time. All right. And then you put the sickle to it, which means you enjoy reaping the fruits of your labor over all those years. Somebody cut you off on 75 and you didn't cuss that time. You used to always cuss out. When did that happen? When did your reaction change from, I, I would have cussed you out to, I hope they're okay, I'm gonna pray for them. I, I assure you that doesn't happen in a day. Slowly, over time, you didn't see the growth that was taking place behind the scenes, but what did happen? When harvest came, you reaped the benefit of the fact that you did not cuss in that scenario. 
But it took what? Months, years, time going on behind the scene. This is what the seed principle teaches us. Your current life is a result of the seeds that you've been planting for years. Okay. So now you're going to start growing and sowing in the spirit. You're going to start sowing and growing in the spirit. Uh, it works this way with everything, right? So financially, if you wanted to uh, try to have a nice little nest egg by the time you retired and you start putting 10% of your paycheck into a savings account or an investment account, it's not going to make you wealthy today. It's not going to make you wealthy tomorrow, not even in a year. But if you did that, if you invested 10% of your income for 20, 30, 40 years, you would find yourself with a very considerable sum at the end of it. And that's harvest time. That's when you can <laughs> pull out the sickle and reap. You know, you're able to retire and, and go work in the church full time and do whatever it is that you want to do. All right. But people sometimes too much, too often, get rich quick, you know, Powerball. I'm going to buy the tickets. I'm going to Louisiana to get on a boat. Or I'm going to Oklahoma to cross over the border to play the slots, trying to get rich overnight. And it's a snare and it's a trap because this is not the way God designed for growth to happen. Slowly and steadily, little by little. Having proper expectations is what helps you to keep your sanity. If you expect these overnight results, it can drive you insane and it can push you away from Christ. You have to have your expectations set properly, okay? Look at this, Proverbs 18, 14. The spirit of a man can endure sickness, but a broken spirit, who can bear it? Misplaced expectations, they're a real problem in society. Uh, when you look at vanity procedures, all right, these vanity procedures are at an all time high. <laughs> you really expect it to look 25 for the rest of your life? Come on, man, it's not gonna happen. Wrinkles happen, dad bods happen, gray hairs happen, balding heads happen, expect it, all right? So with that, I'm not saying that we should go around trying to look raggedy, okay? It's, it's all right, looking nice. If you wanna dye your hair, that's fine. Um, but what I'm saying is having your expectations proper, having your expectations proper. You know that you live in a body that is decaying. You are not going to look the same 20 years from now. Not that you should look bad, not that you just give it all up. All right, so obviously eat well and exercise and be in shape. But if the hair start to gray, that's a, uh, the Bible says that it's, it's a crown of wisdom, <laughs> all right? That's the spin I put on mine anyway, because I'm graying a little early. I say, all right, I, I'm gonna say it's a crown of wisdom. Why not? This is what the Bible says. A hoary head is, is a sign of wisdom, <laughs> gray head. Uh, so I'm just gonna take that and run with it. But my expectations, I don't expect to, I don't expect to have black hair for the rest of my life. Okay, it's okay. I, I can deal with that. You know, uh, take a look at this, right? Marriages. Statistics show that over 50% of marriages now end in divorce. And sadly, this uh, statistic holds whether it's outside the body or inside the body. Have you under, ever wondered why this is the case? And could it be that misplaced expectations play a role? Having our expectations properly set is so important. Because going into marriage, if all you've been, you know, you've been watching a notebook and uh, the princess bride and some other, you know, Hollywood romance novels, you've been reading that stuff. And if that sets your expectation for marriage, man, it's going to be rough. <laughs> okay. You have to have your expectations based in reality. One of the best things that my wife and I did was to go to premarital counseling. And brother Ben Meyer said it straight for us. Still, he gave me some things that I still use to this day, all right? And so did Fred and Linda Green. We went a couple. We went to a couple of places. We wanted to make sure our expectations were set. You need to have your expectations set properly in all areas, not only in your relationships. We just talked about finances, right? You know, little by little, God is giving you the ability to accumulate wealth. What about your health? Didn't take you... Uh, you know, it didn't take you five minutes to gain 15 pounds. It's not going to take you five minutes to lose 15 pounds. You got to set your expectations properly. All right. If you got damaged relationships, you got to know your expectations have to be set properly. All of these things have to start with a seed that gets planted, and then you have to take care of it and grow it over time. If you're teaching somebody the gospel, don't expect them 
to just get in the water tomorrow. Okay, plant seed. You may have somebody else who's watering. So the end result may not come out of you. Maybe somebody five years from now is going to water that seed that you planted. And then God gives the increase then. We can't rush the process. The seed principle. I love this because it helps us so much, especially as 21st century Americans. We are not used to planting and waiting and working. We're used to having it. Boom. Fast food, fast cars, fast everything. So these lessons we get from the seed principle, they apply everywhere. Spiritual life, family, career, health, finances, all of this can be improved if you set proper expectations going in. And the last thing we're gonna cover is motivation. Okay, so I got my preparation. I now have the proper expectation. Now I need the motivation. Motivation, Romans 12, 11 says, don't be lazy in showing your devotion. Use your energy to serve the Lord. Motivation, that's what gives you the power to endure any difficulties that are going to come along. You have to know why you're doing what you're doing. Every person needs motivation to make life worth living. You have people who fall into depression, suicide, substance abuse, many other things, and it's often because there's a lack of motivation to keep going. The motive has been lost. They, they can't find it anymore. And it leads you down some very dark paths. This concept, the concept is simple, but the need for this is very profound. I don't care what you're doing, you gotta have motivation if you're going to actually be able to get to the finish line and finish that thing. James 1.12 says, blessed is he who perseveres under trial because having stood the test, that person will receive a crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. James gives us a huge motivation for staying faithful to the Lord. That crown of life, that's what we want. We have this promise for, uh, from our creator that if we stay faithful and we endure, we get that crown of eternal life. Nobody wants to experience perpetual death. The crown of life is a motivation that keeps us fighting. So if they come and they come after you because you said something and you stood on the word of God and it ends up getting you thrown in prison at some point, Again, right now, you may be cool with it, but watch the seasons and the signs and understand that the winds of change are a blowing in this country. You may not be able to say things for God freely forever. It may happen during your lifetime, the crown of life. Let that be your motivation that keeps you strong and keeps you going no matter what you face, no matter where we go. By the looks of it, the last time I checked, it looks like we're about to have uh, president number 46. And with that, you know, some people are rejoicing and some people are sad, you know, whatever. But what you know is that every administration brings some new changes. And some of these changes, whether it's from the old administration or the new administration, they can affect you. You better have your motivation in order. And it has to extend beyond just the, the politics and the political arena and the things of this earth. Okay, the crown of life is worth fighting for. Now, um, I took a, a look at this and it talks about motivation. This is basically a motivational chart and it talks about there's four kind of quadrants. And at the top, there's positive motivations. And then at the bottom, you see negative motivation that keeps you away from something. On the left, you see something that's extrinsic, which means that there's an external force, uh, which is, uh, really applicable to our lesson tonight because we're talking about thorns. And on the right, you got something that's intrinsic, which goes into last week's lesson that talked about the rocky soil, okay? So ultimately they say, when, you, when you're talking about a motivation on doing something, you want most of your motivation to be in that top right corner where it's positive and it's intrinsic. So this is something that I want to do and I want to do it because of some characteristic in me, okay? So when it comes down to when we're able to reassemble on Sunday mornings, why is it that I get up in Sunday morning and, and come and fellowship with you guys? Well, it could be extrinsic and it could be negative, right? So if I was in here in this bottom left corner, it would be hell fire sounds kind of hot and I don't want to go there. <laughs> so that's an extrinsic motivation for something negative that you want to avoid, okay? Or it could be 
hey, if I go and worship, then my wife will leave me alone while I watch the football game and she won't nag me. So here's an extrinsic motivation. Again, it's external and it's something positive. I want to watch football undisturbed. Positive and intrinsic. I am internally motivated to serve God because of my love for him and my appreciation for what he's done for me. That falls here in kind of this sweet spot and where we want to be. Okay, now just keeping it real, sometimes all four of these different uh, quadrants fall into our lives. I wish, I wish that my children would just have intrinsic positive motivation all the time. But sometimes it's not until they see the paddle that they start doing right. You know, this is a level of maturity they're gonna grow to, but sometimes they need that extrinsic motivation. Uh, I spare not the ride because I don't want my children to be spoiled. Sometimes it just takes that, all right? But this is where we wanna grow to. So we talk about our motivation for doing anything in life. The more you can have it in this quadrant, the better it's gonna be for you. First Corinthians 15, 58 says, therefore my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord, your labor is not in vain. So as we, again, labor for the Lord, no matter what it costs, we've counted these costs, hopefully up front. Before we put our hand to the plow, we hopefully have counted these costs. Jesus gave us ample warning. He gave us ample preparation of what this life could be like. And we're ready and we're motivated. And we have that intrinsic motivation to be able to work for the Lord because we got that crown of life. So you want to seek motivation so you can be passionate about every single thing that you do. If you find yourself, sometimes we do, drifting, all right, drifting through life out of habit and you have forgotten what your motivation was. To uh, take something from Jesus as, as he talked to about the church in Revelation, you have forgotten your first love, okay? What was your first love? What was that thing that brought you to it? Why, why did you start following the Lord in the first place? How excited were you when you first got out of that water and when you first decided to give your life to God and you've become a drifter? Drifting is a vice. Sin, okay, the literal definition of sin involves some form of drifting. We cannot be drifters. God does not want a church full of drifters. He wants people who will passionately stand for him, passionately and intentionally. Not just moseying along not lukewarm, but on fire for the Lord. All right. So uh, what we're going to talk about here tonight is I want you to take some time to think of a, a time when proper preparation, expectation, or motivation helped you to stay on track. And then share with us what lessons you learned from that experience. So once again, when did proper preparation, expectation, or motivation? When did it help you to stay on track, to get back on track if you were off, off uh, the track? And what lessons did you learn from that experience? Okay, so uh, if you want to turn your camera on a fellowship, again, you don't have to. You can leave your camera off. Don't let that drive you away. But if you want to turn it on and, and join in in the group discussion, uh, we are all here, and I'm going to go ahead and Kick it off. So you guys, share your experience, please. <laughs> oh, it's super quiet tonight. Does anybody have a time when your preparation, expectation, or motivation helped you out? And how did it help you? What was the lesson that you learned? from using preparation, motivation, or expectation. Steve Farmer, you look like you want to share. Oh yeah, I'll call some people. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, since you said that, it's funny I'm wearing this t-shirt, mm -hmm. the, the Army. Um, I remember when I joined uh, basic training and um, of course they tell you to prepare, you know, to start running and eating right because you know you're gonna you know, exert your body and your mind and all of that um so i tried to prepare myself for that uh which that's almost impossible when you're trying to do that 
but um, it, it did help me to try to prepare for the worst and uh, set those expectations. And, and whenever the worst wasn't what I thought it was, it, mentally, it made it easier for me to, to get through that process. And basically just taking one day at a time and seeing the end in the beginning uh, was real key to success uh, being in basic training. So mm -hmm. looking back at all of that, in which I didn't really even think I would even make it through it. Yes, I did a lot of <laughs> um, So uh, I'm hoping I'm answering some, some of that part of that question. Yeah, yeah. Okay. But yeah, I mean, it, yeah, those drill sergeants will definitely motivate you, uh, will, will push you to a limit to where you never even expect what you would be able to do. And so now it helps me to realize that when I really put my mind in something, it really can be successful. You know, my races might be a little different from somebody else's, but eventually I can uh, complete that goal. Steve, let me ask you something. Did that yes, intrinsic motivation from the drill sergeant, did that help you develop intrinsic motivation? Yes, it did. Uh, initially, uh, it didn't. But once I got through the process, then that intrinsic, if I'm, if I'm making sure I'm saying it right, that intrinsic helped me to understand that, man, I can do this. Now, what else do I want to do to go to the next level? For example, like when I went through that uh, gas chamber, I thought that was going to be one of the worst things possible, and it was. But once I made it through it, I thought, man, I'm still alive. Mm. Oh, what's the, I'm ready for the next uh, challenge. Let's do this. You know, so yeah, intrinsic motivation. Yeah, I, I think that's a key point. And it makes me think about uh, Carolyn Page, my dear mother. And she had the uh, unfortunate task of raising me. And I gave her a few fits. But you know what? There are some things that she made me do when I was a child that I absolutely hated. And I find myself now as a man raising children, those things are ingrained in me. They went from being extrinsic initially to being intrinsic now. Uh, now I cannot stand to see a dirty house. I cannot stand to see this stuff that didn't bother me when I was a kid. I, my room was so messed up all over the place. But I tell you what, she drilled it in me. And eventually I adopted that. So the extrinsic became the intrinsic. That's one of the reasons I asked. Oh, uh, yes, sir. Steve That's this. good. Yeah. All right. Any other thoughts? Um, I'm going to let somebody else. I might be. Yeah, yeah. There. Not from you, sir. You, you spoke enough. Appreciate you. Thanks, sir. <laughs> Good evening. This is um, Janice Gray, Tanya's sister-in-law. Hey, and um, I had an experience in going for a job interview. I've gone on other job interviews, but um, when I went for this one particular interview, I looked up the company, read about their financials, learned something about the company. And when I went into that interview, I was able to intelligently ask questions and answer questions that I probably wouldn't have been able to do had I not done my research ahead of time. Mm -hmm. I got the job um, and I just feel like that that preparation was what helped me to be comfortable in the interview and to be able to ask and answer the right questions to get that job. Hey Amen. That's a, that's a fantastic example of how preparation helps you out. We've talked about this before, but how Jesus as he was prepared to, to face Satan uh, in the wilderness, he had some preparation that he knew some scriptures as things went before him, different temptations beforehand. Uh, so preparation can help you spiritually uh, by knowing some scriptures that you can call to help you in your time of need. Preparation can help you on your career. As, as Janice just mentioned, if you are preparing for that interview and employers do know, <laughs> they can tell when, when uh, people are have are completely unprepared for an interview or not, so that's that's absolutely a way to impress and and make a, an initial first impression on an employer. So, very good example of how preparation can help you. For sure. Anybody else? How has preparation, proper expectation, or motivation helped you guys in your lives? About his deep thinking tonight. All right, Henry, what you got, brother? Yep. <laughs> <laughs> brother Henry Jones is going to enlighten us. 
Uh, hey, Chuck. So, um, yeah, I would say kind of going off of uh, Sister Gray's example, uh, the idea that pops in my mind, and I've shared this with some friends, is my first job in HR in uh, training and doing uh, what I went to school for is I had to do a presentation. So it was like months of interviews over the phone in front of a panel, had to do a presentation. So I had to prepare for that. Uh, I had friends that helped me so that I could do, you know, presentations in front of them, did all that kind of stuff. And after presenting, I thought I was done and I did it in front of a panel. Come to find out my last set of interviews, the director that was making the decision got fired. Uh, she had a difference between her and the VP. So uh, they said, hey, this is not your last day. You got to come back. And so you got to come back and interview, but now you're going to interview for the VP and you're going to do presentation for all the directors. So that preparation, that, you know, getting a mature, uh, reaching out to friends, like, because I was kind of disappointed, but having said, hey, God brought you this far, God will take care of you. But the part that really helped, the spiritual part, is the recruiter at the time, which I considered her friendly, she was like, hey, when you go interview for the VP, she don't play. Everybody's afraid of her and you've been unemployed for a long time. So if you tell her you've been unemployed, uh, you need to make up something. You like you need to say you've been going to training, you've been, you know, so basically the lot. Mm. And she's like, cause you won't get the job. So I'm like, you know, kind of conflicted. God brought me this far. Now this girl's telling me to lie. But if I lie, then God don't get the credit. So mm. just like clockwork, did the presentation. The VP said, hey, you've been unemployed for quite some time. What happened? So I told her point blank, told her the truth. And But I had my faith in God. Like, well, if I don't get the job, he'll give me another one. And right. long story short, God bless him with the job. So there it is. Very good. I appreciate that. Um, let me read something from the comments. We had a couple come in. Uh, Brother Chase says, I used to listen to uh, a lot of hip hop and now I listen to gospel music, right? So this is one of the things that uh, having that proper, I guess the, the preparation, because if, if you, depending on what goes in, this, this all goes into our mind. It helps to prepare our minds uh, for your daily battle. So, you know, I, I happen to live in a very red area and uh, if I listen to too much NWA <laughs> and I go outside, like my mentality is going to be different. Uh, but if I'm listening to one accord, I can go out and I can deal with, uh, you know, I can deal with people a little bit better. Right. So preparing your mind by based on what you watch and based on what you listen to. Somebody else says collect uh, connecting with biological family that I did not have the privilege of having as a part of my childhood. My motivation was that God showed me I couldn't keep saying family is important without doing my part to overcome fear of rejection to reconnect with that part of my family. So what I'm seeing from both that example and from Henry's example is a level of boldness in God and a level of faith that will push you to do something that uh, you're, you don't really know what the outcome is gonna be per se, but you're trusting in God anyway. Uh, there's another uh, comment that says sharing the gospel requires preparation. You must be motivated and not have false expectations. My last experience was perceived as a failure, but the person came back around. I'd answer another good example, right? So you have to have the preparation and you have to have realistic expectations before you get out there and start evangelizing. Because if you just go on that initial result, you may get an initial no. Just like I said earlier, you may just be, God may have it in mind for you just to plant the seed. So have your expectations properly set. Don't be somebody who goes around trying to um, put notches on your belt for the number of people you got in the water. Like that's, that's not the goal for us. Our goal is to do our parts, whatever our part is in the way that God's gonna use us, okay? Uh, someone else says prayer in the morning before I start my day prepares me, right? So having your day started off on the right foot. Uh, so all of that's good. All right. So to conclude for tonight, your preparation, your expectation, and your motivation is going to help you handle whatever this election result is. <laughs> there are a lot of people out there who are going bonkers one way or another. 
we prepare our minds and we have the expectation and we understand that God is still on the throne no matter who's in the White House. Okay, and we know that whatever happens, his will is going to be done. Obviously, we do our part. I hope that everybody participated in the process of voting and you went out and did what you were supposed to do. Now, once that's done, you've done all that you can do. And you sit back and you move forward with the results. So if your guy did not win, it's OK, because your God is still on the throne. All right, so your expectation, I hope, was right going in. And I hope you continue to carry that expectation out through the week. Just like I'm not expecting a whole lot from Gary Gilbert on Sunday or Cooper Rush or whoever they throw back there to get sacked 10 times and throw a couple interceptions. My expectations are set. This is my uh, RIP to the Cowboys season jersey. You know, rest in peace, 2020 Dallas Cowboys football. With that, I'm going to ask, uh, somebody to lead a prayer. <laughs> Brother Moore, do you mind closing this out, sir? Let us pray. Our gracious Lord and Master, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the blessings that you've given each and every one of us. We pray, Father, that our government will be more in tune with what needs to be done. But even if they're not, help us to always remember that you're in charge. Father, we pray for our instructor. Keep his mind straight, Father. Keep him going in the right direction, helping each and every one of us. Pray, Father, that we're all trying to be a part of this seed, learning how to plant it, how to grow it, how to water it. Father, help us to do the things that we know are right, regardless of who's around us or even if we're all alone. It's in your son's name that I ask this prayer. Amen.